My name is João Bill. I'm the director of the Brazil Lab here at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this exciting event on indigenous forest making and urbanization in Amazonia. We are greatly honored to have with us the world-renowned Eduardo Neves, and I will soon introduce him. Um, today's presentation and discussion is aligned to a new initiative we are developing at the Brazil Lab and at the Department of Anthropology on engaging indigenous ecologies of knowledges with the support from the Office of the Dean of Research and the Humanities Council. By historical, ecological, and ethnographic research, we will seek to illuminate human, non-human interplays and forest-making practices, past and present, so to expand the frontiers of conservation science and also highlight alternative human environment engagements and future-making agendas. I also want to thank the High Meadows uh, Environmental Institute, the Program in Latin American Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese for co-sponsoring today's event. Eduardo Neves, our distinguished guest, is Professor of Archaeology at the University of São Paulo. He has pioneered the archaeological study of pre-colonial mound building societies in southwestern Amazonia and is leading cutting-edge efforts at mapping indigenous infrastructural and forest-making practices. We are in for a treat today. An engaged public intellectual, Eduardo has published in top scientific journals and authored many books, including, most recently, Sobus Tempus do Equinocio, Translation, Under the Times of Equinox. Hope it will be all day. Yeah, yeah hopefully in English soon. 8,000 years of history in central Amazonia. He was a member of the board of the Society of American Archaeology and was a visiting professor in several universities across the Americas and Europe. We are greatly honored and it's a great pleasure to have you here, Eduardo. Welcome. Carolina Levis, she's joining us. She will soon appear on the screen. I can see her here. Um, she is joining us uh, from southern Brazil. Um, she's an award-winning ecologist and research associate at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, a leading member of the Brazilian Labs Research Hub on engaging indigenous ecologies of knowledges. Carolina's research explores the myriad ways in which indigenous peoples and riverbank communities have historically shaped the Amazonian rainforest and its biodiversity. Uh, her work appeared in high impact journals such as Science, and she writes regularly for media outlets in Brazil and the US. Last but not least, um, we have with us Carlos Fausto, uh, who is a professor of anthropology at the Museu Nacional in Brazil and a Pierce Global Scholar. Carlos has been conducting fieldwork among Amazonian indigenous peoples since the 1980s and writing on warfare, shamanism, ritual, art, mythology, and political authority. A prolific writer, Carlos is the author of Warfare and Shamanism in Amazonia and most recently, Art Effects, Image, Agency, and Ritual in Amazonia. A visual anthropologist, Carlos co-directed the award-winning documentary film, Hyper Woman. Together with Mikaias Mugi, our own Mikaias Mugi, research associate uh, here at, uh, at the Princeton Institute for International Regional Studies, Carlos is teaching Planet Amazonia this spring. So it's a great treat to have Carlos here for six weeks, and also we have Aparecida Vilasa with us, who's also teaching a course on indigenous cosmopolitics. All this amidst the incredible energy unleashed by the visit of uh, David Kopenawa. Two weeks ago, we saw so many of you there. So we are here for a treat, as I said, to hear first from Eduardo. Then we'll hear brief comments from Carolina, who be, who's joining us from Southern Brazil. Carlos will make a question or two, and we'll moderate the discussion. So let's give our distinguished guests, especially Eduardo Neves, who's here for the first time, and hopefully not the last, here at Princeton. Warm welcome, Eduardo. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, João, uh, thanks uh, to the Brazil Lab for the invitation of being here. Thank you, thank you, Miquel. Thank you, Carlos, as well. Hello, Carol. I'm seeing you here on the screen. It's a pleasure to share this event with you. And what I want to do, th th this title here is a little bit different from the title that you, that you saw on the flyer, but I hope you know these things are not so different from each other. I think that the, the, the basic message is the same. 
And uh, what we'll try to do here is to explore some ideas that we've been developing. When I, when I say we, I'm talking about a group of people working in the Amazon, archaeologists working in the Amazon, about the, the potentialities and the usefulness of using concepts such as urbanism to try to understand uh, what we know about uh, the, the life ways of ancient societies, uh, indigenous societies in the Amazon. I'll have some conceptual images, like some te a brief text in the beginning, then I'll like mostly be showing um, slides of places, archaeological sites in the Amazon, but also outside of the Amazon. I remember when I was like finishing this preparation this, this afternoon, actually. I mean, this is the Brazil lab, but I'll be talking a little bit about Bolivia and Ecuador as well, since the Amazon is much, you know, although Brazil occupies a large part of the, uh, portion of the Amazon, the Amazon is larger than, than Brazil. So, I'll begin with this image here, which is, was taken in, uh, in Ecuador, in, a, in, the, in the Amazonian part of Ecuador. And that's a typical frontier settlement that we see in many places in the Amazon. We have a small ranch here, contemporary ranch, you have some pastures, but also areas covered by high ground vegetation. This, this picture could have been taken in Mato Grosso, in Brazil, in Rondonia, where I work, but it uh, happens to be in Ecuador. And what's interesting is that we know, be because of previ previous work, that there are many archaeological sites in this area. And the National uh, Cultural Heritage Institute of Ecuador had sponsored a LIDAR survey of this area. I think most of you are familiar at this point with this, what LIDAR is. It's a kind of technology that allows one to see the topography of the terrain, even in areas covered by, by, by high vegetation. And because of previous archaeological work, the Ecuadorian government sponsored a survey, larger survey of this area, and the results are very interesting. That's the same place where I showed you, that's the, the LIDAR image, and if you see everything, if you see it here, you're going to see that all those geometric structures there are earthworks, who were built by people who lived in this area starting 2700 years ago. So this is a very radical example. I like you, and that's the scale bar here for you to have an idea. It's like that, would be like almost one kilometer. So we, we, there's a very dense concentration of archaeological sites of earthworks in an area which is much larger than this one here. This is just a small sample of what we know about the archaeology of this place. And, and that's interesting because, for I mean, we begin to find in, in these new technologies and field work done throughout the Amazon has been allowing us to see these kinds of interesting formations, mostly characterized by the construction of earthworks and assorted structures in different places of the Amazon. And archaeologists have been struggling a lot on how to call those things. Should we call them mega sites, which is kind of a cumbersome way, in my opinion? Should we call them large villages? Or should we just be bold? Or casas de pau, as we say in Portuguese, and maybe call them as cities? I will try to, to, to face this, this challenge and you know, come with an interesting way to, 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 to define those structures. The problem, however, is that cities, I mean, it's one of the most thorny issues in archaeology that we fa face around the world, is how to define a city. It's even hard to define a city today in, co in contemporary context. And if you think about things that happened in the past, where we don't have written documents, which is the case of the Amazon, ancient Amazon, the, the, the situation becomes even more complicated. And throughout the, the throughout the, the, the decades, we've been seeing arche many archaeologists trying to come up with parameters to define cities in the archaeological record. It could be demographic, like in terms of relative size of those settlements. It could be functional in terms of spatial specialization, or it could be like a checklist approach, like looking for attributes that could you know allow one to identify the city in the archaeological record. I think these approaches are interesting, but maybe they're not, they're not, they may not be enough for the kind of challenges that we face in the Amazon. And what, what I'm trying to advance here in a very exploratory, and almost rambling way, is to try to, I'm, I've been searching for new ways to, to come up and face this kind of challenge. And maybe I think, I think maybe we should try to look less at formal attributes, such as walls and things like that, central plazas, and more, as, uh, more at processes. Things such as redundancy, in the use of space, the development of networks among settlements, the formation of gradients between settled places and hinterlands, and so forth. And also, I think that maybe, instead of talking about cities, maybe we should try to change a little bit the focus and consider the, the possibility of talking about urbanism. But in order to do so, it's important to make a distinction between city and urbanism. What's a city and, and a, what, what, what is urbanism? So I'd like very briefly to explore these ideas to see whether they have some kind of validity. 
<coughs> and to do that, I, 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 I I'll have to go back to a presentation that I gave yesterday about you know cultivation and agriculture in the Amazon. We know today, and Carlos and myself, we've written about that, that we can talk today in the Amazon, and, and I can explore these ideas later, if there, there's all time in the presentation later on in the questions. But I think we can talk about cultivation, about agriculture in the Amazon. The concept of agriculture comes, it, it, it's very much entrenched in, in the 20th century archaeology, and it's very much dependent on the idea of domestication. We think about plant and animal domestication, and therefore, we conceive of agriculture as the management or in cultivated of domesticated plants, for instance. But we know the archaeological record of the Amazon tells us that many plants which are still cultivated in the Amazon today, they were never domesticated, such as the acai palm, such as the, the Brazil nut, such as other palms, such as the rubber tree, which are very important crash crops today and were in the past in the Amazon. Those plants, technically speaking, and I know Carlo does, doesn't agree 100% with me on this topic, and we can talk about that in the discussion afterwards, but they're not, you know, technically speaking, they were not fully domesticated. So if you can talk about cultivation without agriculture or without domestication in the Amazon, the question that I make here, would it be possible to talk about urbanism without cities? Could, could it remove the concept of cities and we still talk about urbanism in the Amazonian past? And I think that's a question that comes uh, after this. Would this be a productive path anyway? So is it worth it thinking about along these lines? I think it is worth it exploring them at least. And what I want to do here in the remaining of this talk is to bring some examples that can allow us to, to explore these ideas and test whether they, they, they could be feasible, feasible way for to orient research in the coming years. <coughs> and I think before I move ahead, it's important to mention the work done by our friend Mike Heckenberger, who's an archaeologist, an American archaeologist based at the University of Florida here in the U.S., who's been working for many years together with Carlos, for instance, in the Upper Xingu area. And together with Carlos as well, they published an article in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, when for the first time, which is this article here, they talk about pre-Columbian urbanism, anthropogenic forests, landscapes, and the future of the Amazon. This article, when it, was <coughs> when it was published, it generated a lot of discussion and debate among archaeologists and among other, you know, cons conservation biologists and uh, other people working in the Amazon. And Michael likes to say something which I think, which I think is really interesting. The archaeologists have a, a hard time accepting the idea of pre-colonial or ancient urbanism in the Amazon, but the urbanists, all they, they always invite him to come to their meetings. They, they don't see any problem at all when he talks about things such as urbanism. And in this paper, what's interesting that Carlos and Mike and other authors, they call attention to the fact that they were, they were able to identify the network, which is marked in red here. I don't know if it's clear in the image. These are the archaeological sites. And that's a network of roads, which are marked in red, connecting the archaeological sites in this area, occupied at the turn of the, from the first to the second millennium, CE or, or AD. And also the fact that those sites those archaeological sites, they're much larger than, than the contemporary villages that we find in this era in the upper Shingu in the Amazon today. And the consequence of finding this, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, real, the realization that in order to understand what happened in this era in the past, and I'm talking in front of the author here, so he may correct me in the, in the questions, one of the authors. But anyway, I mean, one has to take a regional scale. Looking at the archaeological site, which is the way that normally we work as archaeologists in the Amazon and elsewhere in the world, doesn't really render justice to the understanding of the functioning of those integrated settlements. So the idea of urban here is like to, to, look, at, to look at a regional perspective and to take into account not, not only the settlements, but also the roads and the paths connecting those settlements in the past. Michael also talks about a concept which is really interesting, which is a concept, a concept of garden city talks about garden cities for these kinds of settlements because we know as archaeologists that the, there was a very subtle gradient between the domains of culture and the domains of nature. We know that landscapes were being created in the Amazon throughout the millennia by indigenous people that we can consider the Amazon today as we call like a, a biocultural heritage, which is also formed by the working of indigenous people uh, throughout the millennia. So, I mean, if these ideas here have, have any kind of validity, we have to think of, of we have to conceive of this sort of ancient urbanism in the light of these transformations of the forest that happened throughout the millennia in the Amazon. <coughs> I'll bring some examples here. So, I'll move away from the Upper Xingu and move away from Brazil. Talk about Bolivia a little bit. Some very exciting work has been done in the last years by, by Bolivian and German archaeologists in the Bolivian Amazon. That's a general map here. So you see what I'm talking about. That's northern 
the northern Delhi department in Bolivia, very close to the border of Rondonia in Brazil. And work done in Bolivia uh, has allowed archaeologists to identify different, like what I'm going to call here, cultural areas there, from one to seven. And area number one, which is around the contemporary city of Trinidad, in that area, some fascinating uh, research is being done currently. And what, this is, what do these colleagues are finding? Heiko Prumer, Scala Jaimes, it's a group of international group of people working there. The different kinds of archaeological sites, in this map here, they're marked as triangles. If you see, and they're the different sizes of the triangles. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, connected by these lines that you can see in this map here, connected by roads. Some of those sites have been lighter mapped. This one for here, it's called Loma Cotoca here in the center of the image, that's a, that's a nerting structure that measures 22 meters high. So it would be the, the equivalent of a seven-store building, high building. And again, I don't have a, la do I have a laser pointer here? I don't think I do. No. So I'm just going to point very briefly here. There's the central structure here, which is 22 meters. We have all their assorted structures. We have roads here, embankments, ditches, artificial lakes and channels. There's a whole transformed landscape made by these people who lived in this area in the first millennium, in the, in the beginning of the second half of the first millennium of the Christian era. So that, that, that this, this place is, not, is on a tall evergreen forest. It's a, it's a transitional savanna between open areas and it's a fl periodically flooded uh, wet savanna. But the kind of investment that we have in placemaking here I think allows us to like, really consider this possibility of you know, dealing with something that approaches the dimensions of a city. I've been working there as well, together with my colleague Carla Jaimes, and we've been excavating a smaller mound called La Punta, there in Bolivia as well. You can see the house on the top of it. This is all artificial. It's like Mississippi archaeology here in the US. And, and, and we've been excavating this mound, and it's very interesting. What we know so far, you can see here there's a profile cut. You can see the different colors and the layers of the construction of the structure. And we know that this, this mound was built very fast in archaeological terms, and like around 200 radiocarbon years. So there was a lot of like labor mobilization. And that's a small one. We're talking about doses of mounds in this, in this area. This sits at the periphery of it, but again, shows an interesting process of labor mobilization for the construction of these kinds of structures. And together with these mounds, <coughs> further north in Bolivia, they're still talking about Bolivia here, we see the construction of those linear roads. If you look at the, 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 these images here, the lines that you see, the black lines, are roads which were built between those islands. Some of them called uh, Islas de Montes in, in, in Spanish, like artificial islands. And if you look at them, you can see this image here to, to the right. Uh, the, the, they were actually built. We have the flooded savanna on both sides, the Buriti or Moriche trees along them, and they were actually built to provide connection between those places in the wet season. So we're talking about, again, a very massive and visible intervention in the landscape. Also, in, still in Bolivia, we see those yellow lines that you can see here. These were taken from an airplane. These are artificial earthworks related to the cultivation. These are like uh, artificial cultivation mounds, and you can see there are like dozens of them spread out to this large area as well. So there was something very intense happening in Bolivia in the beginning, in the, in the, the middle of the first millennium AD. And I suspect that these things that were happening in Bolivia, that generated mound building and all these things, I don't, I'm not proposing a direct, I mean, I think there was a direct connection, but I don't know what kind of causality is involved. At this point, it's really involved to, 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 to the process of state formation that we see happening in the end is at the same time with the Wadi Empire, which was the first centralized empire that we see in the end is here in, in, in or today's southern Peru. We know that the Wadi were eager to trade with feathers from the lowlands and that we still have some beautiful objects that remain from the uh, Wadi trade networks and some colleagues have been proposing that maybe the demand for feathers in the, in, um, in, in, in the lowlands could have, you know, explained or be underlying this process of political centralization or like, you know, intensity in landscape modification that we see in places such as Bolivia. Excuse me. For instance, there's a site which is being just excavated called Espiritu Pampa, which is located in Peru already in an area of forest. And that we have like, you know, uh, that's already up in the Andes, but forested area, tropical forest that we see those structures in Espiritu Pampa was a place connected between the up in the highlands and the lowlands of Peru and Bolivia. We also have evidence, recent evidence of uh, the trade and hearing of, uh, of feathers and, and, and of birds 
from west of the Andes to the Atacama Desert. These are mummified birds that have been uh, excavated by archaeologists living and working in this area. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that around this time, from around AD 500, there was a lot of movement and connection between the coast, the Andes, and in the Amazon. And maybe part of these things that we've seen in the Amazon, in Bolivia, in Macri as well, I'm going to show you later, like in a minute, maybe connected to this, like, we can maybe think of South America as a word system, like as, a, as integrated policy uh, during this time uh, in the past. These are the birds from the Atacama Desert. Okay, is everything okay so far? Too fast? No? All right. All right. So, <clears throat> going back to to the Amazon again. I mean, uh, because of deforestation in the last years, we've been finding this some interesting and weird, uh, hard to explain earthworks in this part of the Amazon. I mean, this map here, if you're familiar with, I was talking about places here in northern Bolivia. So, moving a little bit more to the northwest now, we're talking about this area here. And these black dots that you see in the map are some of those archaeological sites. And this map here is just an artifact of deforestation. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, we know about those places because these areas have been destroyed for cattle farming. But I imagine, we don't know how much fur, further north they expand. If you look at this line here, that's a road. That's why we know so many around there, because there's a road connecting Boca do Acre, which is an Amazonian state to Acre. But I really suspect that these things go all the way to the northwest, to, to the west and to the north as well. We know at least of one large geoglyph in Kalawari, which is already in Amazon state. And these are the kinds of earthworks that I'm talking about. These are like geometric structures, squares. Sometimes like, you know, uh, we have more than one mold. They're concentric. I mean, again, this was covered by forest until the 1970s. We just know about those places because people begin to grow pasture for cattle farming recently there. We have more than 400 of those sites. Another one, if you look at here, like oh, shoot, we have like three molds and then those linear structures that we see coming out of them. I'm, I'm actually, I mean, I've been excavating some of those sites, but I'm more interested in the roads than actually in the sites. I'll tell you a little bit about why, the reason why in a moment. But we do have some maps that shows us that this geoglyph, this like earth structures, they're much more widespread. They're not only found in this area in southwestern Amazon, but also you know, in, long, uh, in a long arch going across the southern rim of the Amazon. We're talking about, again, hundreds of earthworks. Most of them date from starting around 2,500 years ago. So there, uh, some of them are earlier than, the, earlier than the ones that we saw in Bolivia, but there was a peak in construction in the first millennium of the common era as well. well I've been working one of them. I've been excavating one of them. If you look at this image here, can you see that there are mounds there? Around the central plaza, and we have a big road coming out of this place. The first reason why we went to work in this place is because this tower was placed just next to the road. And there was a major debate, the Brazilian National Heritage uh, Institute uh, did, didn't like the report of the archaeologists that authorized the construction of this road there. There was previous co contract archaeology done there. And the archaeologists that worked here before say, you know, indigenous people, they don't make straight roads. So there was a major debate about how old those roads were. And we were called to do an excavation to assess the antiquity of them. So we dug some of those mounds, we did two field schools there, and we know that the road was built around a thousand years ago. So it's definitely a pre-Columbian ancient road. And what's interesting about this site is that we have the roads. I mean, we have this road, there are other roads as well. I'm going to show you a map in a moment here. People are making mounds. They're hanging out, they're like spending time on the top of the mounts. But if you look at this stratigraphy, and it takes some fate from your side, you know, I'm talking as an archaeologist here. But if you look here, you can see like the dark layers. These are occupational layers that, 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 that correspond to the times where people were living on the top of the mounts. And the yellow strata here correspond to mound building activities. And it looks like they're spending more time actually building the mounts than spending, you know, time on the top of them. Because normally, if you, if you, if you look for like uh, permanent structures, like big houses, you're gonna find post modes and other things that could mark the construction of long houses and things like that. So it's interesting because the roads are there, they're connecting the sediments, they're building the mounts, but they don't think they were spending a lot of time on the top of them. It looks like there was some kind of like redundancy in the occupation, but not really permanent occupation. That's something very, very interesting because it challenges ideas such as sedentism that we've been uh, building up in archaeology over the <coughs> years as well. These are some of the images of the roads that we have. 
have parts of them. And we're trying to map the totality of the networks. <coughs> That's an article that we published a couple of years ago, and you can see there's the, each one of those letters corresponds to a site, and the lines here that you see corresponds to the mount, to the roads coming out of them. So again, it, it looks like a cluster, a network. We don't know the size of it, of these kinds of settlements connected by these uh, roads uh, uh, in this area. Another example of roads. Okay, what's interesting, I just want to bring briefly some historical examples about roads that we know in other places in the Amazon as well. But let's start in this area here. This fellow called Antonio Labri, he was a, a he, was, uh, he wrote in the 19th century, he was a rubber baron, uh, and he wanted to find a way to bring rubber from Bolivia to the main channel of the Amazon. And because of that, he financed on, out of his own pocket an expedition from the Rio Madre de Dios, which is in Bolivia today, to the upper Purus River in Brazil. And he published this in Portuguese and in English also. Uh, and that's an interesting report. I mean, but what's interesting about uh, Colonel Labre's trip is that he worked, he walked with 35 people for only 20 days, he was able to cover 200 kilometers. So he was walking 10 kilometers a day with 35 people. He was probably walking very fast. And if we look at his report, I mean, that's the reconstitution of his track made in the uh, 1880s, and that's in Portuguese. But if you, if you read his report, he talks about roads all, of, all the time. He was never walking in, he was never walking with a machete open a trail in the forest, he was following roads. Desta maloca, seguimos para Canamari, passando em lugares antiquíssimos, muitas encruzilhadas e estradas. Seguimos por uma estrada boa e bem cultivada. Passamos por três aldeias com boas casas. A estrada era uma, o caminho de Tupena Putsua, a estrada de Curiguina. The whole report is full of references of roads. He, he talks about paths and about roads, but he was like, you know, again, he was not, he was not walking at random. He, he was following already a network of roads which was like preceded him. Just bring some examples here, for, you know, a very, very cursory look at the bibliography. But we have other examples in other places. That's, that's in the Tomokumaki area of the Amazon, the border of the Guayanas in Brazil. Also like ancient roads connecting the settlements. Uh, um, um, among the Trio people who live in southern Suriname and northern Brazil. You've probably seen this film. Werner Herzog, Aguirre, the Wrath of God, with Klaus Kinski and Rui Guerra. Here, he was Pedro del Sul in the film. But there was a, that's an expedition that went down the Amazon in the 1560s, 1569, that's not mistaken. I mean, it's a long story, I have to make it short here, but what, it had four chroniclers, and one of them, Captain Altamirano, also wrote, ab uh, wrote about roads. So I'm, I won't read the whole thing here, don't worry. But he talks about how they walk for one month. And again, we have to take that with a grain of salt. It's a you know, you know, 15th, 16th century chronic, but if you look at it, then uh, Pedro de Sua left, established a camp in the banks of the Amazon, and then they found a way, very good and very wide, very similar to the ones that they've, that they've seen in Peru, up the mountains. And the, the, way, the way it went straight, following like, you know, what he called tumbles by the other, very, you know, full of people, um, and we walked for more than 30 leagues, 30 leagues, which you know, would be 140 or 240 kilometers. Again, I'm not saying that, that's very hard to find a precise extension to the extent that he walked through, but we're talking about a stance road network reached the main bank of the Amazon at that time. After 30 days they went back and then when they got back they found that Pedro do Sua was already killed by Lope de Aguirre, if you know the story of the film. Okay, I'll jump this one here. I'm just getting towards the end here. And also some more recent work done by Daryl Posse, who was a very important uh, American anthropologist, but worked for many years in Brazil, he's now deceased. But he also talks about road networks among the Kayapó, Gorochiri, in southeastern Amazon, he talks about around 500 kilometers of trails, and the fact that they're planting trees and useful plants along those trails. So roads today in the Amazon, is, they're a vector for destruction. But if there's any kind of sense, George talking about urbanism and ancient roads, these were roads, these were vectors for the exp you know, expansion of those practi practices of landscape management, which were so important in the past. <coughs> Just getting towards the end here. And that's interesting work done in uh, Acre, where, where those geoglyphs are. That's a colleague of mine, uh, Jennifer Watt, and she did off-site archaeology. She's, a, she's an archaeobotanist. 
She was, she wasn't working inside the archaeological sites. She, she was doing test pits outside of the sites. She was recovering samples in radiocarbon dated those samples in, in micro plant remains, and she tried to understand what kind of vegetation outside of the sites corresponded to the time where these places were occupied. And she found something very interesting, which was the replacement of bamboo covered forests, which are typical typical of this area, by palm covered forests. In other words, it was a replacement for one kind of forest by another kind of forest, which is a different thing that we're, what we're doing today, which is destroying those places to plant soybeans. So try to try to wrap up everything now. I think if there's any sense in what I say here, I think I mean if we go if we can go ahead and keep on thinking about urbanism, and I think urbanism is part of the story, I think it's more interesting to understand these processes in the long run, and um, I think uh, uh, we should, you know, conceive it of it as processes alternating dispersion and concentration of people with subtle limits between the domains of nature and culture, and above all, based in the production of man or in management of, of abundance, which is the opposite, which is happening in different Amazonian countries today, including Brazil, which is the, the replacement of that abundance by the production of scarcity. And what are we doing now? We, Tasso, um, as a very part of this group here, you know, we, that, that's his work, I don't have to, to, to build on that, but you know, everything in yellow here is being lost. What are we doing now? We just got a grant from National Geographic, and we're doing LIDAR survey in some of those areas that, that they are marked in numbers here in the Amazon. Each of, each of it has 400 square kilometers, and we want to fly on these areas, we're doing a consultation with the local population who live there, and we want to use the archaeological data that we can gather here as another way to block further deforestation of those places, because according to Brazilian law, archaeological heritage needs to be protected. So we know that the law, I mean, thinking about Al Capone a little bit, he was arrested not because of, of his crimes, but because of the IRS. I think it's another way to try to frame people who are destroying this heritage, is using archaeology based on the concept that the Amazon is a biocultural heritage important to everybody in Brazil and in the rest of the world as well. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Carol. Thank you. Um, I'm very, very happy to be part of this um, event. And I want to thank you all that you make it possible. And I'm also glad to be part of it, this because Eduardo is um, a colleague and he has um, inspired me in many sense. So I'm happy to share and discuss some ideas about ancient urbanism, management, domestication of the Amazon with Eduardo and also Carlos. And Eduardo presented a fascinating talk about urbanism and how these um, are changing the way we understand the Amazon and the um, effect of, of pre-Columbian populations across um, the Amazon. But first of all, um, I want to, to share with you my view about the Amazon and my work um, that is related to this idea that the Amazon is one of the major centers of plant domestication in the world. So instead of, of talking about the Amazon as a place where we kind of have uh, many types of cultivation and management activities without domestication, I want to make a point that um, there were like many species that were domesticated in the region at different degrees. Yeah, so, yeah. You're right. so, so we will, we'll, uh, if, if, if Karina comes back, we'll bring her back yeah. with a question or something. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. And it's a real pleasure to be here again. And uh, what I will try to do is to make provocations. Some of them are for Carolina Levis, but she wouldn't be able to hear, but I can tell her um, later. 
In fact, I, I call it a little friendly provocation because we have been working together and discussed these things to, together for a long time. And sometimes we agree in the interpretation, sometimes we don't, but we are always trying to experiment on ideas and empirical data. So, w one thing that it would be clear if uh, you had uh, listened to Carol Carolina is that in the last decades, there has been a major shift in the understanding of the relationship between human and nature in the Amazon. The forest is no longer seen as the fixed element to which human societies adapt, but rather as the product of long-term human management practices. And this shift from adaptation to management was decisive to redefine many research programs in the Amazon, such as historical ecology and landscape archaeology. Despite the many, many virtues of these programs, they were scarcely impacted by post-humanist anthropology and its critique of anthropocentrism. So my first provocation, it's, it goes also to Edu, uh, is what would happen to our models of Amazonia if we complexify our conception of human action by integrating it into a wider network involving multiple non-human agents. Would such move, there's a, a set of questions, such move help us to make our scientific con conceptions more commensurate with indigenous ones, which as we know, give pride of place to non-human agents, including spirits. So let me just give two examples to make these questions more concrete. So what exactly do, do, do we mean when we say, for instance, that Amazonian dark earths are anthropogenic soils? Are we just saying that they were made by human hands, wouldn't it be more accurate to describe human action here as a trigger that aligns the action of multiple actants, including bacteria, fungi, plants, animals, and as you showed yesterday, shirts, in certain conditions of temperature and humidity? If so, shouldn't we try to describe ADE as a relational, multi-agential artifact from the beginning to the end. So this is my first example. My second example refers to a very common cosmological proposition among Amazonian indigenous people that what we call nature is in fact owned by multiple masters, masters of the game, masters of certain patches of the forest, masters of lakes and rivers, etc., 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 who are basically responsible for their fertility. In their practical activities, humans must negotiate with these dangerous forest masters. Thus, what ecology sees as human creative disturbances of the forest are, for indigenous peoples, the result of a series of negotiations with other than human beings. How can we make normal science productively engage with such different ecologies of knowledge? How do we concretely do that in the field? Can we envisage pragmatic encounters facilitated by bridge concepts such as territory, sacred place, etc. to bring these two sides or many sides together. Um, so that's my first set of questions or provocations. The second one is, um, is about urbanism. Um, and it refers to our common effort to find adequate concepts to describe 12,000 years of indigenous experience in the tropical forest. Sometimes we opt to highlight Amazonian specificity, as we did, for instance, in on proposing to replace the term domestication by familiarization, but at, at other times, as, since we create a zone of interference between Amazonian indigenous experiences in a heavy concept from our own tradition, such as urbanization, urbanism, urban. What do you think about these two analytic strategies? What do we highlight and what we obfus obfus obfuscate when, as in today's case, we opt to characterize certain Amerindian settlement complex as a form of, I would say, tropical urbanism? And I would also like to know, you, you ended with that, but uh, I would like to know more what the, politi uh, the, the political implications are in Brazil of showing that ancient Amazonian societies were more numerous, more complex, 
more integrated and had a greater impact on the landscape than we had thought before. So very briefly, the third and final set of questions refers to what I would call the mystery of diversity in Amazonia. Normally, diversification, be that bio, cultural or linguistic, is associated with isolation, separation, and not with interconnectedness. Nonetheless, the picture that arises from your discussion today is that of an intensively connected Amazonia, at least in the last two millennia before the European invasion. So how do you make sense then of Amazonian high diversity? How can horizontal networks generate diversification? Would you relate this fact to certain forms of political organization and or cultural preferences? So these are a bunch of questions that uh, you can ex ex uh, answer as much as you want. <laughs> Responding and then we'll bring Carol back. Okay? Yes? Okay. Oh. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's always uh, great to hear your provocations. They, they help me you know, think in a better way. And I'll try to, to to answer them very fast so we can hear Carol and talk with her as well. I mean, what you mentioned post humanistic anthropology, I, I totally agree with you. And it's funny because uh, Carlos and myself, we published an article uh, 2018 now, I think, where we, we criticized the use of neolithic, the idea of neolithic for the Amazon. It has very much to do with the discussion that Carol was addressing here. But after that one, I wrote another piece, uh, w w which is titled The Call of the Wild. And I was basically saying we have to really give up anthropocentrism in, in trying to understand this, those connections over the millennium. And some of my colleagues were really annoyed with that. Uh, archaeologists, they wrote me and said, you're you really playing the service, like you're really like, you know, you're trying to trash or like discredit everything that we did in the last 30 years, when, when you, you bring back nature as, a, as, a, as an important agent in the construction of those landscapes. But I think it's very, you know, I agree with you, Carlos, and I've been learning that with my anthropologist colleagues and also with, from indigenous people foremost, that it's very, I mean, this was, op this were, op this were open systems, they're not like based on the absolute control of the variables and true, I, I I think that we and I you know we really jumped on that because it was very important to that I think in the 1990s in the early 2000s like you know highlighting the role of indigenous people, but I think it's important now to find a way in between because because just like you know bringing everything to the side of you know anthropomorphism or anthropocentrism really like neglects the, the very ontologies of these people who were the ones who were like, you know, whose past, uh, ancient past we're trying to understand. So I think it's important to, I think post-humanistic anthropology has a very important lesson to teach us. And I'll give you some examples. We talk about Brazil nuts a lot, how important they are, how like, you know, they're probably like ha heavily managed from like at least 9,000 years. But we, we, people who have been working, like they were MP indigenous people from Amapá, for instance, like we have the work of Joana Cabral, a brilliant young, Brazilian anthropologist, she says explicitly that the YMP say that the, the Brazil nut orchards were planted by the Agutis and not by them. And that the, one, the ones who are farming the Brazil nuts are not them, YMP, although they harvest them, but the Agutis, because the, you have these different you know, placements of, of agency, which are not only retorting in human activity, but also other beings who, um, we can think about cosmopolitics, which is the topic of the class uh, about this teaching here. So I think it's important to incorporate this, not only as lip service, but it's to, be, to have a much better and sophisticated learning of how those systems, complex systems, nature and cultural systems were operating in the past. The second one about Amazonian exceptionalism, that's an interesting question because I remember I gave a talk once in Brasilia, Universidade de Brasilia, and a colleague of us, which I think is a very bright anthropologist, Carlos Salchuk, you probably know Carlos, and he said, listen, I, I, I think this is really interesting, but is, do you think the Amazon is so different from what we see? in the rest of the world. And I used to think that it was, and I think it is in many ways, but that archaeology is really like, you know, archaeology is going through a very interesting moment today. And we see a book, for instance, such as the uh, we, we, uh, Grabers and Wangros, The Dawn of, of Everything, which is a very ambitious project, and that draws in a lot of archaeological, archaeological data. We know that, for instance, even in the advance, in the Near East, there was a very large gap between the beginning of plant domestication and the emergence of agriculture. So. I think maybe the Amazon is not so exceptional in some ways, but I think the data from the Amazon is trying to make us think harder 
and criticize some long-held concepts, which are really like, you know, withstand the time in archaeology. And people like, it's good to see that people are taking those concepts based on Amazonian reflection and bringing, bringing them back to other places of the world and making, you know, improving the, 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 the repertoire of, uh, of, 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 of references that they have to explain the archaeological record. I think Brazilian cultural anthropology, social cultural anthropology has done that, has been doing that for the last 30 years. And I'm happy to see that maybe archaeology has been part of the dis discussion and conversation as well. And the political implications are really clear to me because as we, I mean, we're still working in Brazil under the premise that the Amazon is an empty, these are empty territories up, up to be grabbed by the national state, only someone in Brasilia or in Sao Paulo or in Rio thinking about some crazy, you know, new, miraculous solution, which is always catastrophic for the Amazon. So I think, you know, again, we don't need archaeologists to tell us that. We have to hear the indigenous people. But if archaeology has some kind of contribution to these discussions to show that, you know, there's been people living there, the idea that of an empty Amazon results from colonialism, from what happened to indigenous people after the arrival of the Europeans. There's people living there for 12,000 years at least. And that part of what we want to protect in the Amazon today results from the, the coupled agency of indigenous people and what we may call nature here for the lack of a better term. And the last one, the diversity, for me that's that's one of the most fascinating fascinating questions because it is if this data here is correct and we have you know evidence of connectivity among people, lots of roads and connections among people, that's a, that's a fascinating how, what, what <coughs> for instance, why so many different languages? 180 indigenous languages in Brazil, 300 languages in the Amazon, 50 language families in the Amazon. Two in Europe. So, I mean, what, what's so much diversity? I mean, if these guys were like, you know, seeing each other face to face in some cases all the time, normally when we think about cultural diversity, of language diversity, we think as a passive outcome, for instance, of geographical isolation. But I think we can use the data from the Amazon to flip this thing upside down and say, listen, diversity was something which was valued. It was cultivated in a way that forest was cultivated as well. And that's a lesson for us to learn because we live in a world today that where diversity is being sacrificed in the name of massive production and things like that. So that's something to be explored, but I think that's a very important question. Thank you. So I, I was saying that um, in an ecological point of view, the Amazon has been described by all these interactions between uh, many different species, but humans were not kind of part of the system before the work done by Eduardo Neves and all uh, many other archaeologists working in the Amazon. But now we know that the Amazon is one of the major center of plant domestication in the world. Why this is happening in the Amazon if the Amazon is so abundant of, of plant resources that are being used by people? So what we, we can uh, describe and what we have been finding in the Amazon is that the forests around and on archaeological sites are very rich, concentrate a lot of species that are being used by people today, mainly, main, mainly by um, um, using as food resources. And these species, when we look at these species and populations of these species in details, we kind of find some signs of domestication. And if we imagine that people were kind of moving everywhere and expanding and sharing many plants across the Amazon, they were kind of dispersing and also collecting uh, plants everywhere. So I don't know. I, I think that we, we cannot abandon the term uh, domestication because this is part of the story of, of the Amazon. But uh, we, we can view the Amazon as more similar to um, a kind of a mosaic with different intensities of human activities and different intensities of plant domestication. So, uh, which could be more uh, like um, old secondary forests than these climate ecosystems, but still extremely rich in plant species. 
So how can the Amazon be so rich in species, plant, animals, but, but also were highly modified by ancient societies? What type of food production systems have sustained these past human populations and maintained biodiversity? This is something that we are kind of um, um, discussing in our work, and I want to know a bit more how Eduardo and Carlos uh, think about that. And another topic that um, I think it's quite exciting is about the scale and intensity to which past indigenous societies shaped Amazonian landscapes. This is one of the most debated topics in ecology. And Eduardo has uh, shown to us uh, the potential to reveal much more uh, sites if we use, for example, LIDAR, LIDAR uh, data sets. And in a new study, we estimated that at least 90% of Amazonian earthworks created by past societies remain undiscovered and mostly are hidden beneath the forest canopy. So the massive extent of archaeological sites and widespread um, uh, distribution of, of past societies is critically important for establishing a new understanding of the region. Given this high diversity of archaeological sites and indigenous peoples across the Amazon, can we kind of discuss how intensively and extensively past indigenous societies modified Amazonian forests? I think these two uh, topics are quite um, uh, extensive, but we can discuss a little bit more about them. Well, thank you very much, Carol. It's always you know, good, to, uh, again, uh, always to talk with you as well. And uh, Carolina has this way of talking. She talks very slow. With a, with a very hard and interesting question, that, you know, that, which is great. So, I mean, I think domestication, we've been, dis we've been discussing this thing, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes over beer, sometimes like in symposiums, like all over the, over the years now, like, you know, maybe like almost 10 years. I remember what the first time in Ecuador and Quito that we talked, 2013, 10 years ago. I mean, of, of course, domestication is an important concept. And it's funny because you, you're, not, you're, an, you're an ecologist and, you know, I am an archaeologist. And archaeologists love the concept of domestication, but I seem to be more eager to give it up in a way than you are. And I'm, I just want to make make it clear here, I don't think domestication we should throw it away. I mean, there they, they are plants in Amazon which are clearly domesticated. We know, we have the evidence. What's the way to, how can we account for domestication? Genetic modification up to the creation of a new species. But I think that, and I think, you, I hope you, I know, I think we agree on this. I think domestication just tells part of the story. So my reaction against domestication may be, it's a reaction against my colleagues in archaeology that established an intellectual tradition along throughout the 20th century where domestication was a key step or, or you know or a process in the establishment of what we call the Neolithic. It's a kind of a unilinear, uh, trium triumphal perspective on human history. I'm not saying that you think this way at all. And that, you know, people who didn't domesticate or just domesticate part of the plants, they were kind of left behind. They were like semi-agriculturalists, semi-whatever, horticulturalists, you know, there was, there, was, there was a way to qualify. And what I'm trying to say here, and I think I tried to say that in this article together in 2018, is that domestication is very important, but it's just one part of the story. There are other plants where not domestic, I mean, but then we can define like how, how you can go ahead and discuss how we define domestication but i think if we focus only on domestication or if we try to put domestication along a ladder of semi-domesticated or like almost domesticated maybe we'll be missing the most interesting part of the story which is the gradient of forms this with different forms of connection that were established between people and, and, and plants and i think we agree with that, that with the fact that there wasn't you no know, uh, an extensive, I'll go back to the extensive and intensive in a second here, but there was extensive landscape creation throughout the millennia in the Amazon. And I think domestication is, was important, but just one part of the story. I don't know if I'm being clear, but that's, that's how I've been thinking about that. So maybe like there was a provocation to, you know, to attack domestication. You know, the domestication is very, the Vavi law of all these guys are very important in my heart. Like this, you know, people <laughs> talk about that, but I think that's it's, right. we should, well, 
<laughs> yeah. But I think it's just, you know, uh, one part of the story. And I think, again, intensification, I mean, it, it, these are concepts which were very important in archaeology as well. Intensification is a good, archaeologists abuse the use of the concept of domestication in the 1960s and 1970s, based on the work of Esther Bozerup, a very important economist, who wrote a book called The Conditions of Agricultural Growth. She was basically based on a criticism of, to, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Malthus's ideas of scarcity and population growth. And he said, listen, people can intensify. If they live, live, live living in a, in a single plot of land, they, cult, cult, they can cultivate more and more. And the more time that a plot of land becomes cultivated, in, ter in terms of being followed, that's an intensive, intensive pattern of cultivation. But what's interesting is that archaeologists use this idea to try to explain the emergence of the state in the past, or uh, of political centralization. And again, I think we can flip that concept upside down in the Amazon as well. If you think of it as a Brazil nut stand, which can be grown for 500 years, that's intensive in a way, but you don't have to have uh, terraces and channels to cultivate it. So I think even the, the idea of intensification can be flipped in an interesting way based on what we know about Amazonian data. But at any rate, just to try to stop rambling and be more objective in my answer here, if this idea is right about the neck towards and the, the, and the nodes and the roads, probably th there will be some places in the Amazon. And, and you, know, you mentioned this idea about like the almost 10,000 mounds uh, 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 across the Amazon, which is really, uh, mounds and networks uh, across the Amazon, which is really, really interesting. I think we, we can expect that some places there will be, there'll, there'll be, there'll be stronger landscape evidence of modifications, and other places like more remote from these nodes could be less evidence of uh, this uh, kinds of transformation. Hopefully we're gonna have data which is refined enough and we need to have the, the, the ground truth in as well, going to the field, doing you know archeological and archeobotanical field work, to, uh, well, environmental field work to get this data, but eventually we're gonna come up with this kind of lattice model of a gradient of different you know levels of transformations across the Amazon. That's something for the next decades, but I think that should, could be something very interesting. I don't know if I ask for you, Carol, but thank you for the questions. So can, can I just jump in yeah. and uh, bring back to the last point that Carolina <coughs> mentioned, which, which for me, in my mind, resonated with the question of why so much diversity, you know? So, so, so Carol, can you think that this, the, the ways, the networks, the nodes, the, the work, you know, the, this earth, you know, earthworks, you know, how they worked and proliferated, how do you see their relationship to this maintenance of, uh, of biodiversity? Because you seem to suggest that there is something like a certain theory, an alter theory of conservation of sorts at play there. Am I reading you correctly or? It's very special in the case of, of the Amazon, I think is that uh, the landscape work in some places intensively modified, but the, the way that people interact with other uh, species was in a way without destroying the relationship with these species. So incorporating new species in the systems. So what we, we are finding is that the diversity of species on these earthworks and outside these earthworks is more or less the same. So people created a system, a system with is quite diverse in species, like our agroforestry systems with different species that can be combined, like animal species, trees that can be combined with um, resources for animals, for example. So uh, people in, enrich the forest with uh, species in the way that they could modify the land, but without destroying the land. And that's why it's, it's, um, the Amazon, I think, is so special in the sense of when we discuss domestication, because the process of, of, of modifying the landscape was it was different than in, in other places where the resource where um, maybe the natural resources were not so abundant as as Eduardo 
um, um, try to, to make this point. So the management of the abundance of the Amazon was something very important, but also people were kind of selecting and, and increasing even more the diversity and the abundance of these species. They were not satisfied in a way that it was. And I think um, that's why I think when we kind of um, try to, make, to, to, to put domestication in, in a side and, 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 and say that we, we have other process happening there, I, I agree with you. There are many other process happening there, but we, we cannot, cannot like uh, put in a separate way, like uh, people are managing wild, populations and were domesticated, fully domesticated some species. I think we are dealing with a gradient of interactions and relationships between humans and other uh, non-humans or the, or the beings. And when we, we kind of uh, frame domestication, we try to, to show these gradients of different levels and degrees of, of, of modifications in plant populations, modifications in landscapes that I think um, is better framed uh, than when we kind of separate and create a distinction of uh, we have fully domesticated populations and we have wide population managed uh, by, by indigenous people. And, and that, that's why I, I, I keep using the term domestication. This is fantastic. Uh, I Carlos, just you want to, to, I'm sorry, sorry, I was just asking if Carlos wants to briefly respond, but maybe you should also collect some I, thoughts, because I, I, I think, think I could see people here just I think we can edge. start getting the, the questions, so, and, and, and so if when I have collect, to, more to it, you know. Yes, then you collect more. Why don't we collect some initial responses, because I think there are some big issues that are uh, floating around and uh, you see like scientific intellectual debates and, um, and different perspectives, disciplinary perspectives, but we also see big political ecological issues being brought to the surface here. Why don't we collect a few brief comments and questions? Yes, Matthias. This was fantastic. Um, I was struck by the roads and the connections in diversity. So I was wondering, can you give us a sense of what the politics of the Amazon looks like in 800 AD that helps us make sense of what the hell is going on because political contact at that level one would presume would either imply a sort of supranational authority of some kind which could be religious it could be of other nature or one would presume a lot of warfare what's going on can I jump in? Yes, please. Just to connect to that, that question about the roads, knots, nuclei, and, uh, and other findings. I was, you know, fascinated by that, and also curious because uh, you said road system. And that brings, I think it connects to Matthias's question on warfare, and what is the core, where is the periphery, since you are using the, uh, the term, or you use the term road system. So I, I was just wondering if you could share a little bit more uh, about the connectivity, uh, about competition that also, you know, ensues when you were talking about road systems and like, was there a core, was there a periphery uh, in this case? Uh, but I think it's a follow-up follow -up question to what Matthias just asked. Okay, Noah? Yeah, so do you think by using Western markers of ecology, ecological development, societal development, that you inadvertently remove indigenous agency from the the conversation while also um, considering the use of indigenous like point of view or in indigenous ontologies of ecology and environment. Um, I'm thinking both in the southwest in terms of the the road system that we know connects with South America um, both through the Puebloan structures at the same time period looking at genetic evidence of macaws and things and also um, looking at like the development of uh, domesticated or semi-domesticated via a Western phylogenetic, phylogenetic structure um, in comparison with a uh, built environment. Yes. Next round then. Okay. 
Please. No, I, say, uh, I can say it later on. Yeah. You please. Okay, so thanks for the questions. Oh, and for and Carolina, if you want to jump in, you just raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the questions. I'll start with the, the, the first one, political systems. I, I, I don't think there was any center. I mean, I think it really changed from one place to the other. I was going to bring another example for the talk, but then I was afraid it would get too long from the mouth of the Amazon, from Marajo Island. But I mean, what we, uh, again, I think there was a lot of variation. We can say at the outset, there was nothing like the state ever, I think, in the Amazon. People have been looking for, I'm trying to be uh, directing my answer. We can like, you know, I can try to develop these ideas, but there was something there was no permanent higher level political structure that, that happened in the Amazon, Amazon, as we see, for instance, in the end is with, the, with Wadi and later on with the Inca, which you know, and also in some places here in Middle America. So, and I think, I mean, there was, I don't think there was a same, in, in, in Bolivia, the first example that I showed you, like, you know, the high Lomas, I think there was some kind of like political hierarchies, well marked. There's some archaeological data that tells us that there was, there was differentiation in the burials. Some of the people were buried with, you know, metal objects coming from the highlands. Uh, look, it looks like the men were eating more corn than the women because of the isotopes. So that's something that needs to be understood better. But if we move further up, and for, and that's, uh, you know, I'm, 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 co I'm coordinating a project now in this area, which includes Bolivia and, uh, and Rondonia in Brazil. And the question that we're trying to ask, together with paleoecologists, is like, why do we have what looks like the emergence of more centralized political structures towards the, uh, the open areas in Bolivia and the lack of centralized political institutional structures towards the north. I don't think there was anything like, there was, no, was nothing permanent and centralized in the areas covered by, by tall evergreen forests. So if you ask me, and connecting to, to Mikea's uh, point here, I, don't, I think we're talking about nodes without any major center. I think these were loose you know, decentralized political structures. We have evidence of warfare, not, not at that part, but in the central Amazon, what I've worked for many years, we've, we've done several palisades and, uh, you know, ditches that I think are connect, connected to, and there was a change in settlement patterns and certain ceramic assemblages. So I think that there were places in the Amazon, and there's a lot of tradition about warfare as well, maybe like a different way. Warfare wasn't related to state formation, as we see in other places, but actually to political fragmentation. So I think there was, I think it's, it's an interesting model, and I then, then go back to towards answering the second question here, like think, thinking about uh, you know the misuse of Western markers. Maybe think you know talking about politics without you know net networks without center, like you know we don't see like this kind of center periphery, uh, uh, well marked. Uh, division in, in on those policies, at least the ones that we know so far. And I think I agree with you. I mean, we have to think about it. It has to do with Carlos's point here. It's important. You know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a step that we have to take. And, and you know, and uh, we have to do a better job as archaeologists is, is, is to incorporate this, this perspective, which, they, again, they're not like, you know, it's not paying lip service. They're not accessory, but they're fundamental towards like a more sophisticated understanding of these deep histories. That's what we try to do when we talk about familiarization. And, for instance, like trying to replace it uh, with the concept, with the idea of domestication. I think that's, uh, and again, urbanism may be not the best way to, 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 to come up at the end of the day with a way to describe this, but I think it forces us at least to move our gaze from the local level to the regional level. And I think that's something important that we have to do. And, and I'll be very comfortable about, you know, some better way to understanding and you know and, and defining and describing this this processes that you know doesn't necessarily have to use the term urbanism, but I think maybe maybe an interesting way for us to you know to focus our attention and come up with a, in a more sophisticated way to understanding this. But I agree with you. I think it's important to do this. Yeah. Let me just <coughs> jump in. Carolina, you want to say something? <coughs> <laughs> so please, you first. <laughs> I want to include you in, the, in this uh, question about how intensively and extensively uh, people have modified the forest because um, something that is really difficult to detect uh, or to see the legacies of, of um, indigenous peoples today, for example, um, uh, Nukak peoples, that were moving around and they were not like um, uh, changing in the way that we can like detect on the soils their modifications. So the legacies of their activities could be considered very subtle. 
that we cannot detect in archaeological records, for example. But they were kind of extensively changing dispersing plants. They were uh, moving from one place to another. So maybe they changed the forest much more than um, uh, these societies that Eduardo are uh, showing us that created this type of uh, earthworks and that we can like uh, call or urban uh, centers or, or something like that. So um, what I, I'm trying to understand is how we can um, detect and, and include in our archaeological and ecological studies these different uh, subtle ways of, of forest making. And that's why I want to know your opinion about it. What? Well, uh, let me just so start with that. Uh, to, first, to, I try, and I speak like a social anthropologist now, represent that field now. Uh, <laughs> the whole idea was that we wanted to differentiate what happened in Amazonia and in the Americas in general, because you have to think that the Americas were for at least 15,000 years not in contact with the rest of the world or scarcely in contact. So there is there was something specific from here that developed here and not in other parts of the world. So this is one of the things that we have in mind. The second is that the, the Amazon as the largest tropical forest in the world would be also a place of different human experiences uh, comparing to other parts of the world. Um, of course you can relate that to for instance New Guinea as well but it's kind of different. So uh, we wanted to, and this was uh, Eduardo from the beginning, uh, trying to disengage the kind of uh, human experience in the tropics, in the tropical forest, uh, in relation to domestication in the way it happened in the Near East and in the Mediterranean area, which not only represented modifications of animals and plants, but also a system that involved forced labor, control of people, control of animals, control of, 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 of uh, plants. And then we had, we, see, we saw in the Amazon something that was clearly different. When you look at the at a, a home garden, a Sweden or something like that, it's not controlled at all. It's not a plantation. It's not a, a system that organizes for working and producing one single thing, but it's, a, but it's a multitude of species that are put in relation. And so there is a, a huge system of transformation in f from one type of forest into another type of forest, etc., etc., etc. So calling that domestication always kind of immediately in social anthropology engage the imaginary of the Neolithic Revolution, which in fact is not as uh, at least new, new work is showing that it was not as, as bad as uh, uh, Gordon Child thought <laughs> described. So that was our main main uh, uh, argument and, and, and then not to think about um, uh, the contradiction that we while we were saying that at the same time it is important Amazonia was is was one of the few important independent centers of plant domestication in the world but not animals there was only Muscovy duck that was can be thought as as domesticated in in the the, the tropical forests or in the lowlands so uh, that pu puts also another question, but then the question of what kind of uh, social organization corresponds to that, well, we, have, we are talking about here an area that is as big as the coterminous USA. So we should also think about that different regions would have different situations at different times, so not kind of flatten the description. We have to put the, the, all these things together. But actually, one important thing is that 
it seems that in this whole area and also in parts of the what you call lowland South America, which includes the Atlantic coast and the, 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 the Atlantic forest, there was no centralization. And, it's in, and we would find like not a capital. And then I remember a phrase by Levi Strauss who said one day in his life, 100 years life, that uh, South America was, you know, the Amazon was like the Middle Age without Rome. And of course, but then we have a question. A state in South America is not a virus from outer space. It's something that happened in the Andes, in Mesoamerica. So it poses us also this question, why there was so much diversification and non-centralization in, 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 in this area compared to other areas of the of the 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 continent, and that's why we look at the, for instance, if you think about the Andes, after the Wari Empire and the Inca Empire, we have basically we have different languages, but not as many, and it was basically divided between Quechua speaking and Aymara speaking people, so which is the effect of the expansion of an empire to impose a certain language, to homogenize certain activities, practice, etc. And this certainly didn't happen in Amazonia. Why? We don't know, basically. But don't you give some hints? Like you're <laughs> philosophers too. I have a but don't, you don't, leave, don't leave it to the philosophers. The, 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 the archaeology is... is you know, can, there's some political philosophy work. here going on. No? Totally, yeah. I, and yeah, I think <laughs> you have a question. Yeah. So you yeah. want to make a question? Yeah, can I connect? Can yeah, please, uh, man. Yeah, please, uh, man. So this is okay. So this is all very fascinating. My head spinning with all the thoughts. Um, so I think a lot about conservation science, and both from a very biological approach, traditional approach, to the more interdisciplinary one. And I'm hearing these terms of um, urbanism, urbanization, um, and also topics of trade, uh, trade of of plants, trade of animals, right? in these time periods, in different time periods. But I'm thinking about now because your conversation and your concepts and the way you're engaging with them really disrupts um, a lot of the way we think about uh, environmental issues now. For example, I work in Iquitos, Peru. It's a, a city in, in the Amazon, right? Um, and it's this example of this emerging urbanizing environment why is it called in, you know, it's a city, but it's also expanding. And you have migration of people um, from all around the, the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon mostly, to the city. But the, the way that it's conceptualized with like ecologists and biologists, at least where I'm working in Loreto in Peru, is, you know, this is, this is a new city, a new city. Same with the concept of trade. Um, oh, the, the urban market these markets came about because of the establishment of the city. But that's not the case, right? We see these networks, we see trade, we see diversification of species. So, so I guess this is more of a comment of, well then, if we're conceptualizing um, urbanism and, and, and thinking about these networks, um, then can we really, are these new urban environments? Where do you make a distinction between the urbanism back then versus the new cities coming up now, or like Sao Paulo or Iquitos or the tri border in Peru, Colombia, and Brazil? And where do you now distinguish? And I know that's really complicated because how do you define an urban system, right? Anyway, all I'm saying is what I'm trying to clarify is that um, in a conversation, like these are new topics as we know they're not like trade or consumption of wildlife or plants that's not new um but distinguishing that from this right i don't know just a, a comment and observation <laughs> there do you have any more uh, colleague yeah, so i'm a bit this question of domestication is one i find a bit troubling uh and it's really because i think in domestication we start slipping in ideas uh like Western ontologies about sort of ownership, property, um, or ideas of like master, I think was mentioned before as well. Uh, whereas actually, you know, sort of working with that preceded to the like, thing about Amazonian perspectivism or perspective as ideas. 
Um, in the of ontologies, surely we need to be thinking about kinship. So even approaching this like, archaeological area through with an, well, uh, an idea of domestication, I feel like it's going about the problem in the wrong way, or going about this issue in the wrong way, and almost like what might, rather than seeing sort of plant domestication, plant ownership, instead of looking at more like the plant kinship side of bringing in this anthropological point, what could that offer a different, like that could really offer a different way of like reading these environments. Um, and something that could be much more productive than sort of going about it where you're, you're inadvertently slipping in Western ontologies to somewhere which has operated with an entirely different ontology particularly for the very thing that you're uncovering. I think this brings back to that initial comment of Carlos, you know, how, how do you actually incorporate like like analytically but also methodologically, yeah. you know, that, that that question. And and, and I think I had a, a, a fat comment. I really like Carolina the nuance, she used the word subtle. There's something very, very nuanced and subtle that you are trying to you know, to in language, you know, as 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 an actor, as an as an actant in this process, you know, in a certain way that cannot necessarily be captured by archaeological methods or by our own analytics or even by our own ways of thinking of the env environmental politics that you're trying to to bring to us, and it's and I, I found that incredibly intriguing, but also refreshing coming from, from an ecologist, you know, just to mark that, you know, even though we, we cannot solve that, I think there's something, you know, bordering on a, on a poetics of sorts, but I know with an incredible political force, you know, that, 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 that's looking for some kind of, of, um, uh, of acknowledgement of, of something. And maybe that approximates something of, the, of an engaging indigenous ecologist in the plural, you know, yeah. So, Eduardo, you want to? Yeah, just so comments. I'll start with the domestication one because it has to do with Carol's comments, and then I'll go back to your point, which I think is very interesting as well. I, I, yeah, I think Carol, I, I, again, I, I, I agree with Carlos. I think maybe the reaction against, I'm not, you know, I think domestication was part of the story, but I think we, you know, we're both afraid of falling prey to this idea of, of absolute control that may be like brought together with the concept of domestication. And that's in the end of the day what's destroying the Amazon. The, illus the illusion that we can control like we, we, according to our own technologies and do whatever we want. And that's not gonna work. I'm not saying they defend this at all. The, the, and, uh, you know, uh, but I think that's, uh, so okay, yeah, again, it, it's, 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 it's part of the story, but I don't think it doesn't tell the whole story. And it, and it goes back to your point. And we, well, the way, one way that we try to account for this is like to, to propose another concept, which is the idea of familiarization which is another way to deal based on kinship uh, and, uh, ties that people establish with plants and animals that comes that's Carlos's idea comes from his own work and we thought because domestication comes from domus the idea of house and familiarization like deals with the idea with kin kinship like, there's something like you know which is embedded with the idea of domestication I'm not saying that you say that at all Carol but you know <laughs> in the intellectual tradition of archaeology that's really like the idea of like subjugating nature, control, nature, controlling nature. And we think that, again, this, this is coming from our intellectual tradition, the social sciences, and in archaeology, it's a dead end in terms of conceptually speaking, uh, expa expa explaining this, this, uh, these relationships uh, throughout the millennium. Let me finance for you. So I think, yes, we've been trying to come up with different ways to frame those connections. And, and it goes, and then I come to your point. I mean, Iquitos, Manaus, Manaus is like two million people. There's no roads. The only road from Manaus is to Venezuela, but you cannot get by. I mean, you can, but it's a it's a it's a rough road <laughs> to get from 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 the south of Brazil to Manaus, and it's a two million people. Most people in the Amazon today live in cities. I mean, like thirty million people in the Amazon, and most you know more than half I think of the population of the Amazon is urban today. So we have to consider that. And also, we also know that roads in the Amazon it, are, are a path to destruction. So roads are really bad. And there's a major discussion now about the new, this like the people wanted to reopen the roads from Porto Velho to, to Manaus and 
the consequences can be very, very bad. So, um, so yes, I mean, roads are bad in the press, and cities are com Amazonian cities. I mean, I love Manaus and I love Berlin, but they're not, you know, they're complicated places. They're like, you know, problems with hygiene and everything, but I, I think they're fun places to be as well. So, how, how do we account for this? I think, you know, we're talking about different forms of urbanism. If, you, if we're going to stick with urbanism, and again, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to carry that. If, if, if we have a better way to f understand these connections, I'll be happy to jump and find other more interesting ways to, to understand them. But I mean, if we stick with urbanism, just for begin on the beginning of the discussion, very different ways of urbanism that we see compared to what we see today in the contemporary Amazon, based on something that Carol mentioned, which I think is very important, and that, that João just mentioned here as well, this subtle gradient between these domains of like, you know, human or whatever, human occupation or domains of culture and the domains of nature. And today, like, the, the, it's a much more drastic and strong barrier which is being built. So, yes, I mean, if we go, and we have that evidence of trade, as you mentioned, in different places in the Amazon, Central Amazon, Mount of the Amazon as well, these ones that I made from the Amazon towards the coast in Atacama. I mean, this probably was happening, or oh, you know, in different places with different goods being traded with diff by different people in different parts of the Amazon. And again, it's an interesting challenge for us because trades normally, like you know, are linked with the idea of market specialization. When people think about urbanism, they think about the emergence of centralized policies, and we have to come up with you know different ways to to to, play, to piece this kind of jigsaw puzzle together. But again, it goes back to, to what I said before, that's what's so interesting about doing archaeology in the Amazon today, because we, it's really, I think we, because we we taking these ideas and we see that we, they don't really apply very well on the things that we're finding, we have to come, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, in Latin America, what would you say, we're we doing something wrong again, we're like a bunch of dumbs, we don't know how to do anything, we're doing bad archaeology, and I think today we can say, no, we're doing good archaeology, but you know, the concepts maybe are not good enough to explain the, the kind of kinds of things that we're finding and that generates new theory and that's very important for to do a, like a you know, more sophisticated practice I think thank you Carol do you want to to add some you know concluding remarks in the spirit that the conversation will continue when we bring you back to campus hopefully in the coming weeks <laughs> I just want to say that I agree with uh, Eduardo and Carlos that we need to uh, use new, new concepts to describe what is happening in the Amazon. I think that familiarization is a good concept, especially if you think about the relationship between humans and animals, um, because, in fact, um, we don't have evidence of, of domestication of animals. And I think that if we could um, uh, combine this, uh, or at least use these different concepts in our works to describe all the complexities of the relationships between um, uh, humans and then humans and the environment, we will uh, like increase our understanding of, of, of the ancient history of the Amazon. So I'm I'm in agreement with you in this sense, and um, but I think we still um, need to we still have um, uh, some challenges to face because we are not kind of describing pretty well, and I think because we are fascinating in finding uh, cities, uh, urban centers, urbanism. Uh, uh, domesticated cities, and we are kind of not um, uh, describing pretty well, or at least we don't have the methodology to detect all these subtle relationships between uh, all the beings that are involved in the, the long-term history of the Amazon. And uh, this is uh, quite... <laughs> Um, um, kind of a challenge to me because uh, we face discussions with other ecologists that um, when they don't find um, evidence or legacies of, of, of um, permanent settlements, they say that the Amazon is not modified or at least people, indigenous people are not um, uh, making the first together with other cities. Uh, so we need to create uh, different ways to detect all these subtle 
uh, interactions uh, with the Amazon or and they also include ontologies perspectives of indigenous people to describe all this uh, history. Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank well, you it very much. It, for it couldn't be, you know, it could be a more like eloquent, you know, way of, of systematizing. I think the uh, for the time being, you know, the, the the big questions and points made, and I think we really look forward to continue this conversation among you guys, you know, and but also with you all here. So let's thank, you know. Carolina, Eduardo, and Carlos for this incredible. <laughs>